Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Today on the show is Kat Timp. She is a comedian. She's co-host of a show called Gutfeld on Fox, and she's a contributing editor at Fox News, as well as has worked at Barstool Sports. So I feel like you can't get two different worlds more than Barstool Sports and Fox, but she wrote a book called You Can't Joke About That, which is just like the perfect perfect launching point to be able to have a conversation about stuff that we don't normally get to talk about, which is sex, sexuality, politics, religion, death, uh, sickness, all kinds of stuff that people just don't always know what to say. And the most important thing is that we have this opportunity to be able to talk about stuff like that because it's through talking about it that we start to understand it. We understand each other and we're also able to process the the challenges of those aspects of life because they for sure have challenges. They're a big deal. Enjoy this conversation with Kat. Go pick up her book. Please hit subscribe and the bell for notifications. And in the comments, let me know what you think. And also maybe like, what taboo topics did we miss? <laughs> Enjoy. You just got off air. Do you record for Fox during the day? Yeah. Well, I was on a different show. I um, We normally record, like I record in like an hour and 15, 20 for Gutfeld. We record at 6 p.m. Eastern. Mm, got it. How much do you do you write a bunch of stuff for that? Or do you have a lot of producers that write everything? Or do you No, do I I I mean all my own stuff. I write all my own stuff and I write some stuff for Greg too. Like I usually write a segment every day. I took off writing when the book first came out, like the first month, and now this week I'm back to writing. Is, is that is that part of like the joy for you? Yeah, it's different, right? Um, just because I'm writing for a, a completely different person. But it's really fun. And honestly, writing is my favorite thing to do just in general. Like the book is what I mean. Not so much talking about television writing, but because it is different. But I think I'm a better writer than I am anything else. And I stay true to myself, which can be interesting because I am not a Republican. I'm also not a Democrat, but I feel like people who are Democrats or or on the left can be like, she works at Fox and that tells me all I need to know about her. But then there'll be some viewers, obviously a lot of viewers like me, but there'll be some viewers who are like, she's not conservative enough or she's not conservative on this issue. She's dumb. So I just kind of feel like what's the point of having a platform just for the sake of having a platform. Um, So I'm always just going to say what it is I actually believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things I want to do with you is like go down the line of all the shit that we're not supposed to say Mm because your book is you can't joke about that. So I thought the most funny way to do that would be to talk about all the stuff we're not supposed to. So let's just take off with politics. You know, I've thought to myself many times, I'm like, why is there Democrat and Republican? Why can't it just be that you just listen to who's running and then have then you actually have to listen instead of just following along with a color. You, you listen to what someone says, like, would that even fly? Like, how come it's not like that? Why does it have to, why do you have to pick a side? Yeah, I I, see, I refuse to pick a side, but I think that what the two party system does is it kind of allows for corruption because people are always going to defend their own side or they're always going to say, okay, well, what about what that other person did that on that other side is worse. And that's how the government on both sides gets away with so much stuff. I mean, you can take the exact same news story and talk to someone who's Republican and talk to someone who's a Democrat. And it's like, they didn't read the same thing or they, it, it wasn't the same event that they're talking about. And, um, I think, if you just think in this binary way, you don't really have to think at all because then all the thinking is already done for you. You don't have to think, where do I stand on this issue? A lot of issues are complex and there's a lot at play. You don't right. have to do that. You can just be like, okay, was it a, if I'm a Republican, I can say, oh, if a Republican did a good thing, it, it's, if a Republican did it, it's good. If a Democrat did it, it's bad. Um, and so that's actually the enemy of critical thinking because you don't have to think, which is easier, but obviously results in some pretty stupid outcomes sometimes. Yeah. I mean, you know, someone that I like is um, Jordan Peterson. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know if you've listened to his work and yeah. all of him speak, yes. but, you know, one of the one of his main points is having conversations like we have to be able to talk to each other. If you can't talk to each other, then we don't learn. And you really don't want to get you don't. Everyone shouldn't agree on everything because then you don't have growth. You actually have to have disagreements, but then communication. And why is it so damn hard for people to communicate with an open mind and be able to 
say either, okay, I changed my mind or I'm wrong. Like, why is that? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think that's one of the main reasons why I wrote the book. Um, I talk about, you know, I had, I almost died in 2020. I had an emergency ostomy surgery. I'm okay now. I had it reversed, but um, I was at home recovering and I talked to my dad and he was like, Kat, like, what have you not been through at this point? And I said, well, dad, you know, I I was on, I was pretty doped up. They give you a lot of oxy if you have a surgery like that. <laughs> but I was like, dad, like everything you go through, you're automatically building a connection with everyone else who's been through it too. And I was on oxy, but I was right. Um, but then I thought about it more and I was like, what's the use if we can't talk about it though? Um, and so how I, that's how I got the idea for this book. Cause I think a lot of books about comedy and about speech are like, I have the right to say whatever I want. And if you don't like it, then like, fuck you. And that's all true. But I think that totally ignores the way that it can also bring us together. Um, because like you're saying, if we can't fully express ourselves, then we can't fully understand each other either. And I also write about how there's so many different issues where there's these huge gaps and various demographics of people between what people say they believe and what they actually believe. So we've kind of created the wrong rules that not like most of us don't actually even agree with because we're all so afraid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's the solution to that? Like, I don't, there's a, there's sort of, there's a saying, and I don't remember who says, whose quote this is, but it's basically that um, instead of trying to fix, fix an existing system, just create a new one. So like, is it even fixable or is it just, create a new one and start a commune like I've been talking about for five years, which will probably <laughs> actually end up in the same thing because the commune will get popular. It'll be super fun and everybody will be having a great time. And then all of a sudden there'll be too many people. And then we're like, well, we kind of need someone in charge with the stick, you know, like yeah. I'm in charge, I'm talking. And then all of a sudden you're probably gonna have to have like a secretary and cause there's going to be bills and you have to redo roads and stuff. And then all of a sudden we're going to end up in the same place again, probably. <laughs> But the commune would work for a while, I think. I've had the exact same thought, actually. Really? Uh, my country would be called Kadistan. I've already thought of that. But then I'm like, <laughs> then we'd run into the same, you know, and I'd be like, Kadistan, you do what you want. You take care of you. But then, you yeah. know, again, like you said, I, I probably couldn't handle it all by myself. And I don't want to. I don't want to get into politics because I don't want to make decisions for other people. I don't understand how you would want to, like, people would want to go into that. I just kind of want to be left alone and leave other people alone. Um, but when it comes to speech stuff, you have to just, I mean, for me, I've always just decided I'm going to try to lead by example. And that's the reason why I wrote the book the way I did. Um, a friend of mine who works here, his name's Guy Benson. He has a radio show here. He interviewed me and he had an advanced copy. And he said, as I was reading it, I was like, she, did she really just share that? Like, did she really just, you know, make that joke about her, you know, her mom dying, like her experience have, with her mom dying or her uh, medical emergencies or, and it's, yes, I did because I want to prove that by example, I want to show that actually, yes, you can joke about everything. And if I was going to write this book and say that, then I had to actually prove that I meant it because, you know, the end result is that I found all of it healing. I found humor healing through all of these traumatic experiences. And the other thing that you need to do and the other part of living by example is to also be measured in your response to jokes that you don't like or to someone saying something that maybe even offends you because I know everybody says like facts don't care about your feelings and that's true but also feelings don't care about your facts sometimes like humans are emotional creatures I'm a very emotional person I'm very sensitive but there's a difference between being sensitive and expecting the whole world really to revolve around your own sensitivity that's just being selfish so I think that being measured in your criticism, if someone says something you don't like, you can say, you know, I, that hurt my feelings. That's different than demanding that they be fired or something, you know, this or that. And I think we need to weigh intention more. Someone was just trying to make a joke that is different than someone who is trying to be a jerk. Right. Exactly. If somebody uses like a derogatory term as slang versus like, because it's just kind of part of culture versus something that is it intentionally meant to make you feel horrible. That's right. Or how about just like uh, that guy over there and like, you know, we're having a crisis moment in culture of like being able to call someone a girl or a boy right now. Right. And like, what if it, what if you, you don't mean anything by it, right? You just like trying to like use a reference. It's really just a guide to like <laughs> bring attention. Oh, that person over there. Like, I don't know. I totally agree with you. Like, I've said this even in relationships. 
If something yes. doesn't seem right, just know my intention. Like my intention is like, I'm not trying to hurt you, right? I'm not trying to make you feel bad. What What is the, like, I don't know. I, I, I think identity politics is a huge problem right now. Yeah, I do think it is because I think that also the people who claim to be the huge activists for this, they don't, they're actually not doing themselves any favors. I mean, when it comes to speech historically, I mean, from like the civil rights movement to gay rights movement to, you know, Susan B. Anthony, all that historically have been very pro free speech and pro First Amendment because they understand that groups that are fighting for things that might be marginalized are the ones that need free speech the most. And also, let's say like going back to the trans thing, let's say your main issue, the thing that you care about the most in the world is trans activism. And the last thing you want to do is treat somebody who, for example, does what you did and acts, you know, maybe accidentally says something that hurts somebody's feelings and be like, okay, that's it. You're a transphobe because then people are going to stop asking questions. And there's not like there's a very small percentage of people that are trans. So a lot of people have never met a trans person in their entire life. So yeah. if you really want people to understand your cause and understand people and you have to be open to having people talk about it without being afraid to talk about it. That's so true. While there's a healthy amount of awareness that could be created. Yes. I think there's a dark side of people wanting to have an excuse and be to be a victim. I absolutely think that that has to be the case, right? Because, I mean, there's really, I mean, I, I, there's this new idea that, like, I'm white and someone else is black, then that means that, like, I there's nothing that I can say that could be relatable to that person, which is crazy because I don't know what it's like to be a black person, obviously, but that doesn't mean that as humans that we would have nothing in common. And there's this idea now, even with jokes, that, if it draws on, you know, an experience of a woman, meaning a biological woman who's born a woman is still a woman, then that somehow excludes trans people. Just because it's not about you doesn't mean it excludes you. It's just not about you. And it's it does apply to a lot of people. And there should be, you know, an outlet because there are unique things that come with being a biological woman. Like, you have a period and, you know, you worry about different things than biological men do. That's not excluding anybody because you can also then use your own voice to share your own experience. And what we've done now is like you said, maybe people, like even talking about blackout, just people are like, then they just don't talk about race at all. Or you're like afraid, like, that's not a good thing either. That's the last thing people should want. And especially when it comes to jokes, when people are trying to make a joke, they're trying to make people laugh. So the intention there is good. And especially with comedy, the only way to know if a joke works or not is to try it. Because there's been times it's so where so dangerous. Is it that is dangerous, but it's as hell. Part, it's you can't tell. I mean, it's part of doing. It's. I mean, I I've done stand up on and off. I'm not really doing it right now. I'm kind of doing live shows that I'm getting back into that are like half stand up. So I'll, I'll probably get back there again because it's hard to quit once you've done it. But really? uh, Why? you don't know. You can think something so funny in your head, and then you go on stage and you're like, oh, that didn't work. And now the penalty for that is like your whole career's over. And yeah, right. And you You're don't canceled. know because you don't know how it's going to come off or how people are going to receive it because we're all different. And if we make people too afraid to try and what's going to happen is let's say you don't like this one joke. You can be like, like I was saying, or you can be like, okay, that it hurt my feelings and leave it at that. But you have to keep in mind that you have to be measured in your response because you might be making other people afraid to make other jokes that might be about subjects that really resonate with you that you might need during a difficult time in your life. Sure. I mean, I, I agree with you. You said a few minutes ago, you said that, you know, humor is is healing. And I think a big aspect of the healing from my perspective is that you start talking about it. You just get it out there, which is why it's so good that your book is about talking about stuff you're not supposed to talk about because yeah. no matter what it is, when we don't get it out and we suppress it, that sticks in the body and becomes disease. That becomes um, a projection when someone makes a comment or does something because you've got something sticky in there. And when you just joke about it, you just you get it out and you start clearing the air and we can all we can all laugh and you can and you it's like a form of processing it. And so like I feel like the last Mohicans are comedians to being able to you're like the last line of defense to being able to say I'm going to say just about everything. Yeah, and I mean, if you treat something as oh so sacred and it's oh so untouchable, that gives it more power over you 
you know, and by totally. laughing in its face, that takes the power away. I first started doing stand up. I mean, I talk about this in my first chapter where I was living in LA. Things were not going well. I was very broke. Uh, I lived in like this horrible apartment where I, I slept on a yoga mat. Then I lost the apartment. And I was living with this bartender that I was like sort of seeing from my waitressing job, but not really. And, you know, I'd explain to him, like, we're not really together just because I need to live here. Like, I'm going to be my spirit. Like, <laughs> it was a disaster. Range. You know, I'm like 22 years old. I didn't know anybody. The only people I knew were like my cat that's still alive. And then my, you know, ex-boyfriend Bless. who had broken up with me. And so I started getting on stage and telling jokes about this stuff. And it wasn't that this stuff was funny. Right. But I was able to poke fun at it, which gave me I felt totally powerless the rest of the time. That was the one time like I felt like I had some power. And then hearing other people laugh was my only means of connection through that time. So, I mean, I, that's just kind of how it's been throughout my entire life, because I think the what it's get the, what can make something worse if you're going through it and it's hard is when people are weird around you. If they know like you're going through something bad, like after my mom died, people are like scared to talk to me. I'm like, that's not helping. If we like look at this comedians next to politicians or sorry, not politicians, news people. That's what I mean. But if we use politics as the platform, it's like comedians can joke about it. So you're in this really cool spot where you're on the news essentially, but you're a comedian and you're able to joke about stuff. So why, I mean, where does it fall with people in news being able to have an opinion. I mean, obviously the Tucker Carlson stuff happened and I mean, both Fox and CNN um, getting, having people get fired. So what, what, why, it, where do you see there being a pathway for people in the news to be able to just be honest? It doesn't, and it doesn't have to follow, follow a color or, a or, um, uh, a belief system based on the channel that you're on. Like, can we ever get there? It's tough. And I, like, I have absolutely no idea what happened with the Tucker thing, which is why it's like my book came out the same week and everybody's like, what? And I'm, I really don't know. But just overall, I think that I can understand sometimes how people can get tempted to be like, okay, I have this audience and they love me. And also, okay, I'm making money because this audience loves me. So what how, What if I say this thing that my audience is not going to like, but I believe it to be true? For me, I've just, I've led with fuck it <laughs> like every single time and I don't care. I mean, I work at Fox, but like I'm, I'm agnostic. I'm not Republican. Um, you know, it's like, but I'm also, you know, like I'm pro Second Amendment. So I, I, I'm all over the place. So it would be issues wherever. Yeah. Um, but I'm also like, you know, I'm like for the legalization of drugs and I'm for the legalization of sex work. So I'm not like I don't really fit into a box. So I know that no matter where I went, there'd be issues. But I do believe people are unique individuals. And I feel like nobody can really fit into a box perfectly. Right. Right. And I, I saw Elon Musk got a bunch of shit for what he said about, you know, George Soros, which I don't really care that much about what he said so much as what he said after, which he said, well, if I lose money for saying what I think, then so be it. Now, he has a lot of money. So right, he money. can afford it. The a reason why different. he's okay with losing millions is because yeah. he's got him. Exactly. But <laughs> it's just crazy how remarkable it was to see somebody say that. Like, I'm telling you, I don't care. And it would be better if more people were like that because I also think social media has something to do with it. Like, you could be on TV back in the day and people could hate you and you wouldn't really know. It's like oh, now God. I know every single person, what like what all these people think about my body, what they think about my marriage, what they think about my face. It's like, I know I have a big forehead, like, but they can get into you like, and they're like, I, I liked you. And then you said that about this. It's like blocking you. I'm done. Never again. And I used to not look at it and I've kind of fallen back into looking at it and it's really toxic. It's really toxic for your, your mind, body, and soul to look at it, Yeah. but it's also impossible not to. And I think that that can really lead to it too, because you, you worry like I'm going to upset this mob, but then you also realize who are those people, you know, bots. no, like, right. <laughs> Some or of even, them are <laughs> many of them. But are Yeah. Bots, they're but, assholes. But, I just picture them fat in their parents' basement with a bag of Cheetos and a Mountain Dew, and they're like miserable AF. That's what I picture. Yeah. When people are nasty, I'm like, I feel bad for them. Yeah, I know. It's like I've I've watched TV for, you know, not to brag, for many decades now I've been watching TV. 
And I've seen people on that. I'm like, oh, I don't really like that person or what they have to say. I've never been like, okay, better let them know. I'm going to get out my, I'm going to go tell them. And then while I'm at it, I'm going to say that they're ugly and they're this or that. Like I, I don't, so you have to, you know, but it can feel overwhelming if you look at all these, you know, but it's like, that's just a small percentage of the population. And what percentage is that? And like, those aren't normal people that I would really want in my corner anyway. Just like when you look at social media and you see like super perfect hot women and you're like, God, and you feel so bad about yourself because everybody, everybody's so beautiful. And I like, I've said this to my friends before, but I think it's myself too. I'm like, you know, I walk around in life and I see almost no women that look like that. <laughs> yeah. None. Right. When I do my own life beta test on that, I'm like, yeah, yeah actually, yeah, it's bullshit. There's, they're, there, there's like none of them. There is almost none of them, which means yeah. that there's either almost there's almost none of them, and they're fake because they yes. just use all of the all of the apps. Which that's a good point. Yeah, it's like the exact same thing in the reverse because yeah, it's like they, there's apps that can give you like a whole entirely different face. It, it is tough though, and I think that we really are in a tough spot where people are so afraid to speak and pe- everything is so polarized. I, I, like I feel like if I have this platform, I just owe it to and it's like I'm not religious so I don't I don't know what I owe it to but I wouldn't feel right about so if I've gotten shit for things I've said before but yeah. and it can be tough but I don't know how I would deal with it if I knew the shit I was getting was for something I didn't even believe yeah that I just wanted to like make money off of or make people happy and fit in with the brand I could that I couldn't deal with at least I can say well I said what I felt and I always know that I was true to myself you were saying like you're confused, you know, why are you doing it? I- I'm going to bet it's because it's changed your life. It has. <laughs> I mean, you know, like we tend to advocate for anything that's like we're super sold on. It's like, man, I had tried that low carb diet and it really worked. And you just want to tell everyone or like, hey, I started CrossFit and it was just the best yeah. thing I ever did. And you feel like you have to tell everyone or or you, you know, you get things off your chest by joking. And you're like, I want to tell everyone because this is a this is a cure. Yeah, it really, honestly, it really has been for me. I mean, uh, over and over again in my life. I mean, even when when my mom died, I, I wasn't able to talk about it the way that I am now. I had a really hard time talking mm-hmm. about it because, I mean, I just turned 26. I had just gotten the job at Fox like a few months right after she died. I felt so awkward because people would be like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, and I'm like, yeah, like I know, like me too, but Mother's Day, the first one was tough. And then the second one, I had just gotten a little more comfortable with it. And so I I reposted this to my Instagram. But back in 2016, I posted a picture of my laundry basket and a bottle of Tide. And I just wrote, mom's dad going to do some laundry. And I like laughed about it. And I went out, you know, because I'm like, that's how ugly it is. And that's how, gross. you know, it's like, it's just another day for me. But people were telling me like, you shouldn't say that. That's disrespectful. And I'm like, to who? You never met her. So probably this is harder for me than you. And then I think that just shows when we treat like subjects as sacred just because we're supposed to, we actually end up hurting people. Yeah. And the same people that they're supposed to protect, like in that situation, me. Yeah. Yeah. What do you wish people would have said to you? I wish they would just say that sucks or ask me a question about her or if there's someone who I knew to like tell me a story about her. When someone gets like <gasps> about it, I just say, it's okay. You didn't kill her. And then like, it lifts, lightens it up a bit. And then they, I feel like they can talk to me like a normal person again. Well, you, you disarm the situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which That's what it know, does. it is, it is probably a little easier when it's a complicated concept for someone to make a joke, but you know, it doesn't do any good to not bring it up. What are some other things that you feel like you wanted to bring to light that people have such a hard time talking about? my chapter five, which is called shit bag. So I had an emergency ostomy surgery during in 2020. Um, it was like a fluke thing. Um, it was an emergency surgery. I had the bag. And as I was getting wheeled into surgery, I was like, Oh my God, what am I going to tell people? (laughs) Like I almost died. And I was like, this is so gross. People are going to think I'm weird. What do I do of all the traumas I could have had? Why is this trauma so niche? You know? (laughs) Yeah. And I didn't tell anybody. I mean, I came back to work and I had the bag for five weeks and I just was on air with this poop tube and I didn't tell anyone. <laughs> Where'd you put it? In the front? It, in the back? It's like right here. It's like right. It's it's like right below your rib cage. Like your intestine comes out. So I would have to just be very strategic about what I wore. Um, you could and, hide it and even? Like, 
What? You could hide it? It could hide it. Yeah, I could hide it. But I would so have to, it wasn't like, just like the American people couldn't no. see it, but like people at work couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. I was I wore like really baggy stuff. Like Greg knew, but most people didn't know. Because I was like, I don't want to be weird. And then the second surgery, I had complications where I won't get like super graphic, but like a staple was loose and it was all like the blood was all coming out of my ass. That's like the most polite way I can say it. Mm, diapers. And I write about it in detail in my book. And they told me I needed a transfusion. And that day that they did that was on January 6th, which is like, that's funny, you know? Cause I'm like my friend there who's, he was my flower girl at my wedding, a little gay gymnast boy. He's my best friend. At, you know, oh. he's there. He's like, when everyone asks you where you were, like, you'll be able to tell them you were doing this is what was going on. And I'm like, this is funny, but I still, people were like, so I was gone for two weeks. And I didn't know what to tell people because I still was like, this is so weird. I don't want to say it's like so gross. And then I was like, okay, you know, uh, my uncle, I told the plot of the Lion King as this in a statement without saying (laughs) Kings. I didn't know what to do. And then finally, when this book came out or as I was writing this book, I was just curious. And I thought more about how like people have died with cancer that we didn't know they had like Norm MacDonald, like Chadwick Boseman. And it's like, oh, wow. They didn't want to be treated weird is what they said. And then I Googled the words on a hunch cancer and then how to tell people I have cancer and how to tell people I have cancer had way more results. So Mm -hmm. I all this research also backs up that talking about it in a humorous way when you're terminally ill is actually ranked higher in terms of being more helpful than solemnity and even actually more helpful than physical medication pain relief. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That last one was a small study, but yeah, it's crazy. But I'm a little sense. bit of a hippie, hippie spiritual guru and, uh, or, or like into it. Um, yeah. and, uh, like I believe in energy a lot. And so like just the, the positive energy and frequency of laughing is so beneficial to the body that, you know, I, it does not shock me that there are stats out there that humor, um, can be even more beneficial than medicine. Yeah. And making, and they say it makes people feel better. So I think that's another one because people are like, oh, but you don't mean illness. I'm like, no, I do. And like, you don't mean death. I'm like, no, I mean that. Yes, I do. And um, it's been really healing. I mean, the first time I ever talked about the bag publicly was when the book came out. So mm-hmm. a lot of people at work like realized they were on TV with me during that time and they had no idea. But it is really healing. And that's why my last chapter, I write about how comedy is actually a sort of religion for me. Because it has a lot of the same healing properties as, you know, physically, but also emotionally as religion does and the way it can add meaning to experiences because, and I write in the book about all these things that almost destroyed me and I was able to actually create from those things. Obviously, it doesn't offer eternal life, but it has a lot of the other same properties. I know. I'm still hoping to figure out what what happens with that one. But I think it needs the forgiveness, right? Most religions have a pathway to forgiveness. and. Um, I was Catholic for a long time, so I know enough about the Bible and Christianity and Catholicism. And so Leviticus is like the least chill book in the Bible or one of the least chill. And even that one is like an eye for an eye. And what we do now with comedy and jokes is actually even worse than Leviticus, because if you ask somebody, I don't care how into this, you know, identity politics they are. And you said, name a few of the worst things that have ever happened to you. Nobody would actually say it was hearing a joke that I didn't like. But some people might say it was telling the wrong joke. So if we're being less chill than Leviticus, I think that we really need to fix it. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, we would uh, we would be missing a huge uh, taboo topic if we didn't talk about religion a little bit. Yeah. Um, So you were a Catholic, right? Is that is that correct? I was so Catholic. I was an altar server. I did bread and water fasts as a child for the souls in purgatory. It's like oh. child abuse. Dude, my mom was so Catholic. It's crazy. Like she would put like Benedict medals over all the do- I write about this in this uh, over the doors and like to keep the devil out. So I grew up being like scared of the devil, but I also thought I had this like benevolent being looking out for me. So maybe that's why like I've been pretty needy in a lot of my relationships until I got a lot of therapy because like nobody can be God. But um, I I fell away from that for several reasons. I mean, I was so Catholic. I thought I was going to like, I would go to confession and tell the priest everything like that I was doing that was bad. Even if it like when I got older and the sins were like, you know, weirder things to talk to a strange old man about. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I truly thought I was going to hell. 
And I fell away from it for a few reasons, partially because I don't agree with a lot of the stuff, but like, I don't feel like if you masturbate and I write about this in the book and you like crash your car on the way to confession that you should go to hell forever. Like, I think that's a little, it's like not cool. And I also just make a lot of sense. No, it doesn't. And I also feel like, and I do actually, I have a lot of my mom's family that is very Catholic and they've had a hard, as I talk openly about this and they have a hard time being like, they think I'm going to hell because I'm not Catholic anymore. And they will really go in on me. And I'm like, but you love me. You're capable of loving me, even though I'm not. So like, wouldn't God be capable of loving me? Um, so I, it's, religion is definitely a taboo one, especially, you know, for me to talk about. And it's just, you have to, because I kind of like suffer. I thought it was so bad for a long time. Well, I mean, that right there is one reason to be suspicious. If something makes you feel so bad all the time, how can it be that good when we're literally just finishing a topic about laughter is healing? It's like guilt and shame are literally the lowest frequency energies that you can emit. I was dating this guy and he was Christian. I made some funny comment about it was like some it was like the Jim Carrey moment when he was on the red carpet and started talking about tetrahedrons and oh we're just dancing tetrahedron. So I was repeating that and then he was like, "Oh, we're going to get her to talk to the priest and straighten her out or talk to the pastor and straighten her out talking about me." And I looked and if looks could kill, I was a newsie for sure. <laughs> I was so when I talked to him, I was like, "So you're telling me that because it actually happened. Um, so I'm like, so you're telling me that if there's like a kid in another country that has never read the Bible or heard of it or doesn't have any idea, but they're like a really good kid and they die, they're going to hell. Because unless you believe in the story, that's the only way you get to go to heaven. And yeah. he's like, well, I'm just here to talk about the Bible. If you have any questions about the Bible, I can answer. I'm like, mm, but not yeah. anything else. And it's like, so many wars exist still because of religion. Yes. Like, yes. I mean, why is it, why is religion so divisive? It is. And it's, it's interesting because I mean, like I have, I would love to, you know, I would love to be religious in some way someday, just because I would love to think that I'm more than just like an aging bag of like bones and meat held together by a skin sack. But I, th that's kind of the issue for me too, right? I just, I, I can't make myself believe it. And I hate when people act like that's also a decision to, of mine. Like you don't, why don't you believe it? Just believe it. And it's like, that doesn't work that way for me. And also, you know, that's what I mean when I say everyone has their sacred cows, right? Because there's a lot of people who walk around like, I'm not offendable. I'm not offended by everybody. These, these woke pussies are ruining everything. But if I make a joke about, you know, Christianity, then they lose it. And I'm like, right. no, I'm talking right. about everything. I do mean everything, you know, I, including religion. And I, I can say like the mildest thing sometimes about religion and people are like, yes. I'm like, no, but I can. <laughs> and I respect or like the passive aggressive way, like, oh, bless her. I'll pray for you. Yeah. <laughs> You're saying but, I'm horrible. Yeah, I know. It's like, I don't mind if people say I'll pray for you. And they just like trying to be nice people like, oh, I'll pray for her. Like she's a bad girl. And it's like, no, like, come on. And I just, and it's, it's so I don't, it's like, I don't treat you that way. You know, I'm not like you believe in God and therefore I don't like you, or I don't want to hear what you have to say, or you're this religion and I don't want to hear what you have to say. And I just want to be, have the same respect. <laughs> well, there's like a, a, a little like psychological perspective that, um, the things that we deny, we judge. So like for me, as an example, like I deny myself lazy time. Like I tend to not be someone to sit around and do nothing. So then when I see someone lazy, what I call lazy, I judge them. Right. So think about all the things that they, that like, especially within religion, people deny, right? Like it's kind of like a, the institution itself is built around uh, regiments and doing certain things and not doing other things. And so there's so many areas to deny yourself, hence judge others. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I was doing this bread and water fast in the fourth grade, like by myself, like I wanted to do it. Like I wasn't forced to do it, but I was like so into it. And it's just crazy for me to think about it now because I used to feel bad for other people like that weren't religious. I was like, so what happened? What switched? Yeah, I just, I, I just, I didn't believe it. I just, I just couldn't believe it. I think a lot of it was like certain sexual things being like great, any sexual things, not certain sexual things, like all sexual things being grave sins. Right. And just being like, why? And like, can that really be true? 
And if this person is a great person, but they have sex before they're married, they're going to go to eternal damnation. And like, why? So that honestly was what it was because I saw that as being completely harmless. You know, I saw that as being very much a personal decision that you can make for yourself. Yeah. And that was really what it what it was for me. Yeah. Great. We're on to the next topic, sex. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh I read this book called The Magdalene Manuscript. These this couple that wrote a book, one of them did a channeling transmission from Mary Magdalene about the life that she lived. And that's the first section of the book. And Mary Magdalene is talking about sex being a way to um, like increase what she had sex with Jesus and that they were doing it um, to, she was also helping him strengthen his Ka body, which is the energetic field around you. And it was preparing him for the things that he had to do and and gave him the strength to get through them. Um, But it was talking about just like how you can use it for manifesting and you can use it to, there's just like so many things about sex that are really, really like powerful, but it's been like torn from everyone to even talk about it, let alone learn about it or, you know, uh, get better at being able to use it as a tool other than just to get off. Like, right. I mean, and that's like, you know, one of those taboo things that we're not supposed to talk about. I almost felt bad, like posting that I read a book called the Magdalene manuscript. And it said, it was like, it's tight, like sex is in it. It's a sex magic, sex magic and whatever. And the, the cult of ice, a cult of Horus. And, um, yeah, but I mean, sex is like one of those things that about whatever, I mean, animals do it. Yeah, I I know. And it's, it's, it's first, I don't know why it's so taboo. And I mean, for me, it was like growing up, it was like, no, like it was like really, and I obviously don't think that way anymore. And I talk way more openly about it now. And I, I could, it's just like the shame is so harmful. Cause I feel like there is also this resurgence of some people being like, if you're a woman and you have sex and like you have set, you have a like, too many partners, whatever that even means. And then like, no, you're damaged. Like no one's ever going to want you. And no one will tell these women the truth about, and it's like, that's not the truth. Like, that's not the truth. If you're a woman who's a lot of partners, then you just, you just did that. You know, I, I think it's, it's so harmful. It's so harmful to, because I think really what can be like, maybe if anything, a turnoff to people could be like, if you hate yourself, if you're really insecure, if you do things that don't feel right to you and then you, or you do things that do feel right to you and then you judge yourself for it anyway. I I think that's people really need to be able to be more open about it and own it. Cause a lot of people too, who are judgmental about stuff like that have like weird freaky skeletons in their closet a lot of the time too. Well, they're denying themselves, you know? Yeah, exactly. Right? I've never, I'm going to be thinking about that now, like all the time. I've never think heard Think about, that. like, just think about something that you, you judge in other people. Yeah. My, cause I think laziness is mine too, honestly. And do you I, deny yourself the ability to really like chill out and do nothing? I have a meltdown. I book my schedule like nonstop because if I'm by myself and I'm not doing anything, I'm like, I'm losing time. I'm losing money. Like, what am I doing? Something I I'm wasting, I'm wasting time. I, yeah. Yeah. If it's not work, it has to be work or like a really fulfilling, you know, emotional, social, some sort of thing. Like, you know, whether it's friends or with my husband, whatever it is, if it's not like, if I'm just sitting on the couch, I'm like, I I, I lose it. Yeah. So I think that's probably a big one for me. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting psychological perspective, but it, it works for everyone. So now you know with your husband, whatever he he is denying himself, he judges the most in you. So I know I'm that gonna... first. Ask him what he um what he what he's judgmental about in people. I will, and then you can then you know what he's denying, and then you can just slip it in there after and be like, well. Now I know this about you. Is this true? And he'll be like, oh, that's really good. I'm definitely going to do that as soon as I get home. Oh, my God. Is marriage great? You got it's married a couple great. of years ago, right? Yeah, it's great. And I read about this in the book. I dated a, like a lot of losers. I dated like, I mean, I loved a loser. And I think it was because I maybe wasn't ready. And also because if they were a loser, they couldn't really hurt me. I think that was probably part of it. Like, if a loser doesn't want anything to do with me, then like, whatever, I could tell myself he's a loser. Um, I dated like a lot of, you know, musicians, artists, people like that. And then he's like, 
a white guy who's from Westchester who works in finance and like fought in Afghanistan. He's like an investment banker, like a good guy. And I thought he was like, I was like, he's boring. He has a good job. But on the first date, I wasn't really, my sister convinced me to go out with him. And then I was like, okay, maybe I was like dating a lot of other people. And I was happy with that. I was like dating around. I was like, I don't need a boyfriend. I really truly didn't care. I know that they tell you that you do, but I didn't. And uh, then the second date, my sister was like, just go out with him one more time. After I canceled two more dates on him, he showed up and he was like, yeah, he showed up. He was wearing like a sweatshirt and like he hadn't shaved. And I was like, he's hot. And then we actually never spent another night apart. We moved in together at like four months. Really? Yeah. Damn. Because dates usually get like, I realized like if you get past the third one, it's like the third one. You either never see him again or it's on. Yeah. And he's. Yeah, it was on. I mean, he's again, he's like my polar opposite and he's just so like cool. I mean, he's so patient. I mean, he he's to be, you know, the husband of somebody who does what I do. It takes somebody who's really strong and certain in themselves. Like, for example, I my live shows, I my my live show in Chicago, I was talking about or I mentioned how he still had sex with me when I had my shit bag on. And I'm saying this while he's sitting next to my dad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. So it's like I write in the book and I'm like, here's a copy for your mom. She's going to know you banged me with the bag on. Like he has to be very, he never, ever, ever is like, don't, I wouldn't share that or this or that. He's like, you do you. He's like, this works for you to do you. I'm, I'm, I have no right, nor would it even be smart of me to think that I know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. And so he's very secure and cool in himself, which if I always thought like a guy like that with that kind of resume couldn't be like chill. Yeah. Wow. They say that there's like. 13% of the population is securely attached versus the rest of the people are either anxious attached or avoidant. Yeah. And I'm like 13% really? I don't even believe that. Like I'm not even like I'm anxious, but I I'm aware, I think. So I'm like, what I'm doing right now is wrong and I need to stop and I need to apologize. I'm really self-aware. I think a lot of people are not self-aware. Yeah. I feel like you are really good at um, doing things that make you uncomfortable. Yeah. I do. Where does that come from? I force myself to. Yeah. Where does that come from? You know, I think because my biggest fear is to have not accomplished something because I didn't try or because I was too afraid to put myself out there. And also because I have failed so many times. And if you do stand up and you just like have a hot bomb, you know, I said, I'm I'm, obviously most of my sets weren't bombs or I wouldn't have kept doing it. But, uh, you know, it's like, okay, that's the worst that can happen. And you kind of move on. I think it's way worse to never try. And that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. But I I always, I mean, I used to do these man on the street videos. I worked at Barstool and I did man on the street videos that in like some crazy locations. Like I went to a juggalo convention in the middle of Thornville, Ohio. And it was a much smaller operation at the time. It was just me and like some, this guy, Paul, uh, this, his name's Gaz. He's like actually one of the shareholders. He just, he was a camera guy and he had like these salmon colored shorts on. And it was like people were, it was like a scary environment, but it's like you have the scariest thing to me is to not be scared because then you don't grow and then you never will know what could have been. I hope you write about that in the book. Did you write about that too? I do. Yeah, I do. I write about that in the book about how safe spaces aren't real. Um, anyway, because every different person is going to have a different idea of what that is. You know, um, one person, let's say somebody, people were, someone was raped. Someone might have their safe space be somewhere that that's not going to be brought up. Another person, their safe space who was also raped might be to be able to make jokes about it and talk about it. So it's not real. And there's also research that I write about in my book that shows that, you know, that there's these positive feelings and growth that can come from feeling uncomfortable, that can only come from feeling uncomfortable. So you don't just feel good, but you feel good in a way that only being uncomfortable can do for you. So, I mean, if I think back at all these times in my life that were the most meaningful milestones, I mean, like they were all, a lot of them were really scary things and it didn't even have to be trauma, but even doing stand up comedy is really scary or, you know, deciding, okay, I'm going to, I can't afford grad school, so I'm not going to take out a loan. I'm going to stay here in LA and, you know, try to do internship. That was scary. All of the things that have been the most pivotal moments of my life were the scariest ones. And um, that doesn't mean I'm not freaking out because I am anxious and I do freak out the entire time. But I just say, let's fucking go. And I do it anyway. Let's fucking go. Everyone yeah. write this shit down. Let's fucking yeah. go. And, and just fucking like go. do the shit that scares you. Right. Like, I totally agree with you. What was the environment at Barstool like? Was it 
Uh, how many years ago were you at Barstool? I was there like 2016, like 20. Yeah, it was totally Probably, different. Like, yeah, different office. Like Dave was there and right. it was a different office. I had a podcast and I, w- and I would be in like once a week, oftentimes when like nobody was there. Yeah. But I mostly did like these videos in other locations. Like I yeah. went to Cancun spring break and asked people political questions. That was a really funny one. And like the audio quality, the video is so good. It's so funny. These kids are insane. Like they're wild, but like the audio quality is shitty because it was such a smaller operation when I was there. But I went back recently to do some of their shows just because my book's out and stuff. But it's funny because it? I, I, I was there like way back before they were anything, but they're cool. Like th- th- I, I like, you know, I, I like doing their stuff. Yeah, I've been there. I went there a couple of times for a couple of different interviews and you always it's it's like I, it just seems worlds different than going to work for Fox News. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like it's just, you know, we talked about crystals and you know, all kinds of like weird shit. Um, and we weren't, you know, like they just totally pushed the envelope and, you know, news platforms don't. So did you, do you like, like, do you like being at Fox? Do you like, what is, what, what's the biggest pro and con of let's say like Barstool and then Fox? See, I think that saying that I work at Fox is also almost misleading because of of the show that I do. Um, because at Gutfeld, we do talk about all kinds of weird stuff. Um, it, it is more like comedy focused. Um, Barstool was super fun. And obviously, like you have more leeway. So like, that's a, a pro. But I also have found that I've had a lot of leeway at Gutfeld. And as my book has come out, and I've been able to do these interviews, I have said a lot of things and I've not had a single phone call about how I shouldn't have said anything. So I think that that's pretty awesome. Um, I mean, I think probably the biggest negative is just like the people think Fox is a monolith and it's not like I've, I've said this before, but it's also true. If I've been at a party somewhere and people ask me what I do and they don't know who I am, I've just said like porn. I'm like, I do porn. And people are like, that's cool because it's less controversial than saying that you work at Fox News. Damn, that's so, so funny. That's so true. Yeah. They're like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. And it's like, it's like, you know, if you'll ever see these people again, I'm really truly You're like girl on girl stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, guy, yeah, no, totally. gang bangs. Like, what are you into? I'm like, I'll be like, yeah, like I live in Puerto Rico. The tax, I don't have to deal with the taxes. Like, because it's like, if I tell people I work at Fox, they're like, <gasps> and I'm like, they think that that tells them everything there is to know about me when actually, there's people here who believe all kinds of different things. I mean, even like one of my best friends here who married my husband and I is Kennedy, who was, you know, an MTV VJ in the 90s, who has a show on Fox Business. And like, she's not what you would typically think of as, as a Fox person. Our show is not what you typically think of as a Fox show. And even though a lot of the people around me are certainly, I mean, on Gutfeld, he's he's not like he's not religious either. He's not really super like socially liberal or he's not really super socially conservative. I'm more so even more socially liberal because I'm very socially liberal, but I'm still me. You know, like even if I'm surrounded by people that might not agree with me, I'm still me. So I still have this platform. You touched on it a little bit early on about reading comments. But I mean, for a comedian, man, I mean, you guys are on the hot seat for sure because you talk about the most controversial stuff. So was there an acclimation to that or is is it just is it within you to say fuck it? It How is. And that? also Gutfeld gave me some advice, which has proven to be true, which is that it's never going to be the thing you think it is, which has been the case. Um my biggest issue that I write about, I, I go do a deep dive into this and um, I forget, I think maybe it's the second chapter, third chapter, I, I don't know. But the biggest, one, one of the biggest controversies was I made a joke about how difficult it is to give a cat, like a feral cat medication because they have claws. And it was during a segment about Jimmy Kimmel saying that he was like taking some shows off. This was in 2020. And I did not realize that he had a son with a heart problem. I did not realize that. I remember reading the article and saying that he said everyone in his family was healthy. So I had that in my head. But I was like, oh, it's way harder. Like, I was giving my cat heart medicine. It's harder to give a cat medicine because they have claws. Like, kids don't have claws. Like, making what I thought would be a funny, relatable joke to people who are also childless about how, like, for some reason, kids are the catch-all excuse for anything. Whatever. We were live and we never do the show live and we actually haven't done it live since then because Greg was like, I would like to just remind you that he has. A, and I was like, I just died inside. It actually made it on the watch people die inside Reddit page like it was bad. And I I obviously was like, sorry, I like blurted something out. The next time I had a chance to talk, 
I was like, I'm so like, I'm so sorry. I would never, I obviously don't think it's, you know, I obviously don't think it's more difficult to have a sick cat than a sick child, like a sick, right. you know, but I was like, if anybody took it that way, I didn't, it was not my intention, blah, blah, blah. Everything was fine. Right. Everything was fine. The next day I'm ironically at the vet with my cat and somebody had posted just the clip being like, here she is making fun of the kid because he's a heart disease. Everybody was like, I, I had trouble getting out of bed. It went on for days. Like his sister told me to fuck off and die. People were like, kill yourself. Like it was really bad. And it's like, I, if I, going back to what we were talking about earlier, if I would have actually been like, you know what, fuck kids with heart problems, then I would have deserved all that. But it was an accident. I was talking about my cat. I didn't even, like, there was no kid in the conversation as far as I knew. Right. And um, I thought, I had no idea that that was going to be that. So it's like, I, and then that resurfaced on Reddit again. It happened again. So I'm always like, I can't go into every show being like, is this going to get me in trouble? Because I won't be able to do my job, A. And B, it's never the stuff that I think it's going to be. Right. Like, look at the three minutes of worth of interview versus the th 13 seconds that is out there. Um, so what's the magic to being able to talk about taboo, off limits topics? Like, how do you make a joke? Like, how could you how do you make a joke about that? You know, how do we yeah. how do we formulate a joke about sex or politics or religion or death? Like, what is the magic formula? There is no magic formula. That's the issue is is. Um... So I, I talk about how comedians need to have the right to swing and miss. And like that story I just told me an example of a really big miss. <laughs> that was a very big miss. Um, but there's also, you know, I think it's just you have to talk about it because otherwise you're making it really sacred and giving it more power and making it even more scary than it already is. I have found it to be helpful. I've seen other people find it helpful. And if the biggest worry is that people are going to get mad at you for trying to heal your own pain or the pain of other people, then that's the wrong way to look at it. And you have to just remember that. Um, and also, you need to also remember that you like the jokes don't have to be funny necessarily. For me, it's my job. I'm supposed, you know, I, but I'm just thinking about my husband. Like, he's not funny. And like, thank God. Like, he makes me laugh, but he's not like a funny guy, which thank God, because I'm the funny guy and it works better that way. But um, he has been able to, you know, if I, I was struggling with certain things in the in the pandemic, just I, I don't do well. Like we were talking about when I don't have things to do and I have places to go, I was like melting down and he was making fun of me about it in a funny, light, like in a lighthearted way. And it wasn't really good, but it made me laugh. I was like, oh, this is something I can laugh at. Sure. So it disarms things. And the worst thing that can happen is that it won't and people might get a little upset, but you have to just not care because what's at stake here is to have everybody lose the ability to heal in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So what is, what's your perspective on this whole cancel culture right now of being on the hot seat at all times for offending someone? I mean, you can't call someone a he or she anymore without possibly offending someone. It's, it's pathetic because, and I really do think that's what it is. I think, I mean, there's so much discussion about old tweets, right? Like there was, I wrote oh. about this in my book too, like athletes, like college athletes or whatever, they get signed and they find back that like, oh, like, you know, Five years ago, they said something offensive when they were like, you know, 15 or 17 or whatever, like we all did. And they, there's all this conversation about how it wasn't okay for them to say this thing before they had a fully formed brain or even close to it. And no conversation about who went and looked for those and why did they look for those? Mm. And my suspicion is because maybe they are not where they want to be in their life. And it's like, okay, maybe I can take down this person, but that doesn't make you any more successful yourself, really. And I also think social media removes humanity in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, it's so easy to pile on. You yeah. just, you could just quote tweet and be like this or wow or whatever. And then like, you're like, see, I'm one of the good ones. I like that bad one. You don't mm -hmm. have to actually face that person. Totally. And be just like, hit retweet or repost yeah. or. Yeah. And you don't have to face that person who's like, I lost my job. Like I lost my whole life. You don't have to worry about that. And yeah. also social media there. I, there's research in my book that shows that Twitter, Facebook, these posts do better when they have the moral grandstanding, moral emotional language, the engagement's higher on those posts, which is very different than real life if you think about it. Because if you had a friend like that, that was just preaching nonstop in a condescending way all the time, you wouldn't invite that person over anymore. You'd stop hanging out with that person. But on social media, that's rewarded. So I think that that's a, a huge part of the issue. 
What do you think the transformation with those platforms is going to be? Because it does seem like they're, they get controlled a lot. They get, um, uh, you know, their, the posts get removed. I mean, I had one picture, it was like a, a carousel, of like 10 photos back in Indiana last summer. And in one of the photos, my sister has four kids. Now one of her kids was two and we were at a, like a, a, a lake and a river in Indiana and she was naked. She's two and we're in the water and they took it down because the, in the far distance, there was a naked butt of a two-year-old. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's just so much censorship and also, you know, I mean, there's bots too. There really is like fake stuff. And so, and it's also, you know, people are recognizing the mental health aspect of social media and what it does. I mean, some of these platforms already have built in filters because they're just trying to keep up. Like you don't even know what you look like anymore. Um, exactly. So what is the transition? Like what's going to happen with it? Do you think? I think it gets worse. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, Everything gets worse before it gets figured out, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, especially because obviously I got to grow up without social media, right? Like there's yeah, this whole too. generation of people that didn't. There's a whole generation of people who like they have Instagram when they're like 8 years old. They're not supposed to, but they do. Totally. You know? Not. It's crazy. Like what are the impacts of that going to be? And I mean, with Twitter, I mean, like that's been it's been an interesting shake up with, you know, Elon Musk buying. I, I even wrote in my book, I was like, I have no idea because he bought it like as I was in the editing process. And I was like, I have no idea what he's going to do by the time that well, there was I, a lot of uh, there was a lot of ups and downs to that. Yeah, process. exactly. I'm like, by the time this book comes out, I have no idea. But I really think I think that more speech is better as long as the speech is well intentioned. And yeah. that's kind of where I stand with that for sure. I think being aware of these things, of some of the things like that I do talk about in the book, of the ways in which it's not real life and the ways in which it's different from real life are going to be really crucial because it can really warp your mind in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Maybe if we did, maybe if you totally got rid of like retweet and repost and re everything. Think about how much less traffic there would be if everyone had to write their own things. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's there's I, there's so many different things, right? I mean, and then there's all these different algorithms, and then what are they? And it's, it, I mean, I, I I hate that I spend so much time on it, but I do. It but is, they do a good job of making it like crack. They if do I like knew the, what crack was like. I bet it'd be like that. Exactly. Yeah. Just I like the more. Instagram reels. I'll be going through it. I'm like, oh my, like I've been doing this for an hour. <laughs> Right. Totally. It's so bad. I mean, I'll stop at a stoplight and I will fill my time at the stoplight with it. Yeah. You know? It's really bad. And I think that it's probably going to get, I mean, we all need to like go touch grass. You know what I mean? For sure. Like all of us need to. And, and I think that just more education about it is going to be what the solution is, because I feel like it's also new, especially when we talk about younger people. Yeah. yeah. God, I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, Kat, thanks for writing a book about being able to talk about the things that our people are scared to talk about because it's super healthy and super healing. So congrats on having a super successful book already. And um, hopefully it's just one of those things that keeps going. Thank you so much for having me. You're super cool. <laughs> oh, thanks. So are you. This is really fun. I, I love your perspectives and um, it's probably why you're so popular. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.